You're welcome to Love House Media Outreach. The message you're about to listen to is an inspired teaching from Pastor Godwin Obuche, the lead pastor of the Living Hope International Christian Center, Kanu, Northwest Nigeria. This message will inspire hope, faith, and grace in you to succeed in your work with God. A series of nuggets for you to excel in your life's endeavor and a package of God's seed for eternity. Pay close attention and be blessed. for tonight as we listen to your word as we study as we take values from the pages of scriptures as we look into the law of liberty as we in take in all that you have for us today we ask for understanding and we ask for a desire to put to use that which we have heard from you tonight in jesus name we pray we ask that you open our hearts let there be no distraction let the word not be stolen from anyone tonight we pray for our online viewers we ask so god that they be blessed as we are blessed in person here in jesus name we pray amen you're welcome to the worship on wednesday at living hope christian center we believe that your day was productive your day was value adding um, I believe that you made somebody smile today any day that somebody does not smile on your account is a wasted day amen you are not in this life just to you know consume unto yourself uh, everything that God gives you that will be too selfish and, and life will be too selfish to consume things only for yourself. I want you to imagine that um, life is just about you. How much do you really need? Praise God. You won't be praying that God gives you millions, would you? Because how much do you need? You don't need much. Between you and your family, you don't need more than 200,000 in a month. But do you know what? When you come out every day, nobody knows what you ate at home. Nobody is uh, going to celebrate what you have uh, consumed or the kind of house you live in. What actually counts is what impact you have on others. If you give a cup of water to somebody, the person is more appreciative and there is a sweet smelling savour that goes up to heaven than when you drink the water yourself so life itself is not just about you and i'm not on earth because of me i'm on earth because of the lives that god expects me to touch concerning my own life god has taken care of it that's why he says if we fulfill the condition of his kingdom seek me first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Say, so seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you. So I don't even need to hustle for myself if I do that which concerns the kingdom. Praise God. I needed to drop that thought because uh, it came unto me strongly that we don't live unto ourselves. We live unto the purpose of God. And if from morning till night, nobody smiles on, a, on your account. It means that you have wasted that day. Praise God. This evening, we continue on a teaching series titled Investing in Your Spiritual Life. Last week, we did like an introduction and we talked so much about the fact that your spiritual life is the center of your life. Your spiritual life is the launching pad for your life if you are not invested in your spiritual life your spiritual life is not um, uh, that which makes for um, a huge importance to you then of course you would not amount to much 
you are not just a bundle of flesh. You are more than a bundle of flesh. You are more than your intellect or your emotions or your feelings. You are a spirit and you live in a body and you have a soul. And your soul comprises of your mind, your emotions, and your feelings. Your body com consists of the five senses. Sense of touch, sense of, uh, feet, uh, of um, smell, sense of sight, sense of hearing, sense of taste. That's what your body consists of. And with your body, you are in touch with the physical world. With your soul, you are in touch with your emotions, you are in touch with your feelings, you are in touch with um, your mind. That, in your mind is where you have education, isn't it? Your mind is where you have education. The person is a professor of law. It's about your mind, your intellect. But if you have all of that, praise God, you have all of that and your spirit is dead. You are disconnected from the maker. And if you are disconnected from the maker, you are actually disconnected from the source of your life. You are disconnected from what will make your, your soul and your body function well. For a lot of people in the world, there is an alliance between their soul and their body. And so, the spirit rem is that they, they, they are alive they have a spirit in fact they are spirit being but their spirit is in coma and if their spirit remains in coma until christ comes on or until they leave the earth they will not see god so that thing happened when adam fell man's spirit went half dead not conscious of God. The devil took over and filled the mind of a human being with things that he wants. The philosophy of a devil was what the devil indoctrinated man into so that the body carries out what is in the mind of a man as instructed by the evil one because the spirit of the man which should be connected with God has been switched off. But when Christ came into the equation, we now have the opportunity to have our spirit come alive. And so if you hear somebody is born again, that means he is now in the kingdom of light. He has been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And he can now have the spirit of God overshadow his spirit man so that they dictate to the mind what should happen in the body. Because what is in your mind is what you do. Praise God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is in the mind is what the body does. But somebody can be born again and still his mind is carnal. His mind is like the one that the devil has been training. Why? Because Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 has not come into being. There has not been a transformation. And transformation is a deliberate thing. Transformation should happen intentionally. Transform Just like a child is born and the mother does not feed the child. The child will grow weak and weak and weak and possibly die. But when the child is fed, it grows naturally. It grows organically. In the same way, your spirit man that is born again, that is saved in Christ Jesus, needs to be fed. And that's the reason why we are doing this series called Investing in Your Spiritual Life. So that your spirit man can be strong and it dictates to your mind what should happen in your body. So you are essentially a spirit and you live in a body and you have a soul. So this month we're focusing on developing the spirit man. Next month we'll focus on what? Developing the mind. 
the following month in June, we will discuss how to take care of your body. Praise God. So today, as we continue on investing in your spiritual life, we want to look at effective prayers. Effective prayers. I pray that the Lord will grant me the opportunity to go very deep into the teaching before our time is over. We have three anchor scriptures. First, as a matter of fact, five, but I'm going to read them as we go on. Okay? The first one we will take is First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. They are just single verses. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. If we have it on screen, it will help us to you know, quickly read together. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. Go to the Lord for help and worship him continually. What does King James say? Seek the Lord and his strength. So when you pray, you are seeking God and not just God alone. You are seeking what? His strength. Because you cannot rely on your own strength. You are seeking God in prayers and you are seeking his strength. Seek his face continually. How long? How often? Continually. Seek him. Becky, can you give me a hanky if there is anyone around? It's like I'm the only one that the fan is not facing. Praise God. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. Ephesians 1 verse 18. Can we look at that quickly? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's a prayer of Paul. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This is only possible when you pray. The Apostle Paul was praying so that the, Corinth, the, the Ephesians will have the eyes of their understanding enlightened. In, you know, your spirit man can have its understanding darkened. Why do I know that? Or how do I know that? In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul referred to the Ephesians as people of God who have all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He called them saints. They were already saved. They were saints. They were not dead people. He called them saints. All right? But in verse 18, he said he is praying so that their understanding will be enlightened. Can you imagine? Saints do not have their understanding enlightened. Even though they have in potential forms everything that they have to use for all spiritual blessings. They have everything that they needed in potential form. But because it was not activated, what will activate it? An understanding of their mind being enlightened. They were not enlightened even though they were in God. They were not enlightened even though they were church people. They were not enlightened even though they were God's children. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 8. Proverbs 15 verse 8. Quickly. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So when you pray, you are a delight of the Lord because you are already saved. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Do you know that there are people who make sacrifices and yet they do not have a relationship with God? Why? Because they, they believe that, okay, if you bless God, you will... Uh, you will get what? You, if you give, you will be, be blessed. There was a man in the Acts of the Apostles. His name is Cornelius. He was an alms giver. And his alms giving came to the Lord as a sweet smelling savour. And he had good intentions. Praise God. But do, do you know what happened? Because of his heart, the Lord sent Peter, the Apostle Peter, to go meet him. But Cornelius was not the only 
person who gave arms in the acts of the apostles who wasn't connected with the Lord. But God saw his heart. There are people that the Lord detests their sacrifice. But he delights. He delights in what? He delights in the prayers of the upright. Psalm 17 verse 6. I'm excited reading all the anchor scriptures now. Psalm 17 verse 6. I am praying to you because I know you will answer. That's the psalm is speaking, isn't it? Oh God, bend down and listen as I pray. The guy already knew that he will get answers from God. Praise God. I have called upon thee, for thou will hear me, O God. Incline thy ear unto me, and hear my speech. The King James Version called this prayer of a psalmist a speech. You know there are some prayers that are speeches. Like the prayer of Jehoshaphat, when three nations came to besiege him. It was a long speech to God. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11. That's the last anchor scripture. Matthew 7 verse 11. Matthew 7 11. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall you, your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? For those of us who have children, we are determined to make sure our children don't lack, isn't it? We are determined that our relatives have all that they need. If we have that sense, even though we are not like God in terms of our intent, our day-to-day -day activities and orientation, we know how to take care of our children. How much more the Heavenly Father wouldn't he take care of his own? So if you, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? I don't know how many of us are asking God diligently, sufficiently. But God is a prayer answering God. And our spiritual life will be of no consequence if we don't live a prayerful life. Praise God. So prayer is the most known religious identity amongst all the people who believe in powers beyond themselves. You know, when you pray, it means that you are praying to a power higher than yourself. When you pray, it means that you are insufficient about what you are praying about. And that's the reason why you are seeking external higher power. So for the believer in Christ... Prayer is spiritual breathing. For you and I as believers in Christ, prayer is spiritual breathing. If you are not praying, you are spiritually dead. And when you want to check whether somebody still has got some vital signs when there is an accident or something that knocks the person off or the person is unconscious, what do you do? You check the pulse. Medical people call it vital signs. You check the pulse. You check some things to, to confirm that he's still breathing. If you can't find breath, it means the person is clinically dead. The prayer that you and I pray is what shows that we are alive spiritually. Without it, our faith is dead. Prayer is speaking to God. That's what it means. It is communion. And this is how the relationship that we have with God is serviced. On Sunday, I was talking about, you know, relationship in the context of when communication breaks down, the relationship takes a nosedive. Anytime two persons who are supposed to be in a relationship stop talking to each other, what happens? That's a sign of a end of a relationship. And when they start talking to each other again, it comes alive. So, you call God your father. Do you have communion with him? Do you have a relationship? Are you on talking terms? There is a tendency for us to relate with God only when we have problems. Especially in prayers. 
And God does not want that kind of relationship. In the cool of the day, before Adam fell, the Bible says that God came down and had fellowship with Adam. How much fellowship are we having with God? Apart from the time of asking him to help us accomplish something. And once that thing is accomplished, we take our leave. We we'll go on sabbatical until another problem comes. That is not how to relate with God. If you have a friend who comes to you only when he needs something, what do you call that person? I didn't hear that. Friends, what? <laughs> that's, in, that's interesting. So, God does not want to have that kind of friend. Praying should be and must be the most critical thing for a believer's daily life. Apart from meditating on the word of God. Now, prayer for the man or for you and I is our own end of the communication cycle that we have with God. Prayer is our own end of the communication cycle that we have with God. The word of God is God's own end of the communication cycle cycle that he has with us. So when God speaks to us from his word, how do we speak back to him? In prayers. That's how you keep the relationship you know, very healthy. So the spiritual life is no life at all if you do not have a prayer routine that is effective. Praise God. And remember, we are talking about how to invest in your spiritual life. And notice that you have a soul and you live in a body. So the essential you is your spirit man. Jesus left an example for us as he led an effective prayer life. Jesus. He was God in human flesh, yet he needed to pray. He could call a legion of angels to defend him against the powers of the enemy, but he needed to pray. He was giving us an example that as long as we are on earth, we must what? Pray. Look at Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Let's see what Jesus did every day. Mark 1 35. What Jesus did every day. Mark 1.35 Before daybreak the next morning Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Before what? Daybreak. King James says and in the morning rising up a great while before day he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So if he rose up a great while before morning, before daytime, you can safely assume that he left the house around 4.30 or 5 and prayed until about 7. Oh, what is he talking about till about 7? Which kind of problem does he have? See, that's where we got it wrong. It is not only problem that should take you to God. It is a relationship. He could just have sat there and he's just praising God or worshipping God or speaking his thoughts to him and God speaks back to him. Very early the next morning, long before daylight, Jesus got up and left the house. He went out of town. He went out what? Of town to a lonely place. Where is your own routine lo lonely pray place? Why does he need a lonely place? place because he needs quiet and solitude if you pray in a distracted environment you can't get results it is not going to amount to effective prayers yes there are prayers that we pray when we are in a bus there are prayers that we keep praying all through the day as the bible tells us to pray without season but there is there should be a design segmented prayer time where it is you and God and no noise, no phones, no distractions, no TV. Praise God. He therefore urged us to pray always. In Luke chapter 18 verse 1, we'll look at that. 
Remember, this is a study time. So we get to look into the scripture so that it doesn't look like, ah, Pastor Godwin is just churning out his theories. These are not my theories. These are God's words. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. It says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to teach them that they should always do what? Pray and never become discouraged. Always pray and never. Have you ever been discouraged praying? Yes. But Jesus says, don't be discouraged. Never. And he spake a parable unto them to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Because he had left an example for us. And what is the example? A great while before morning, he left and went into a solitary place outside of town and there he prayed. So if he had to do that, he then has the authority and the integrity to tell us to do likewise. That they should always pray and never faint. Praise God. God answers prayers. And that's the reason why we should pray. God answers prayers. When we pray, he answers. We read that in Proverbs 15 verse 8. We read that also in, in Psalm 17 verse 6. We find that in Matthew 7 verse 11. He said, if you can give good things to your own children, you being human, what makes you think that the Heavenly Father will not take care of his own children? So, when we pray, he answers. He cannot fail in his own words. See, concerning God's word, he values it more than his name. Yet, at the name of Jesus, every knee bows. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Yet, he values his word more than his name. He esteems his word highly more than his name. Why? Because his word is him. In John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so, God cannot deny himself. When there was nothing else, nobody else above God for him to swear in his promise to Abraham that he was going to bless him, he swore by himself. It's almost like saying, if I don't perform what I promise you, I cease to be God. But is it possible for God to cease to be God? It is not possible. It is impossible for God to fail himself. And so, if he asks us to seek, we will find. He has asked us to knock, the door will be open. If we ask, we will receive. In John 14, verse 14, he said, if you ask me anything, in my name, I will do it. But the truth is, how many of us are consistent? How many of us are in faith? How many of us believe that God cannot fail his own word? Are you ready to pray? Do you have what to pray about? God is more ready to answer you than you are ready to pray. He said, before you even open your mouth to pray, he is ready to answer. He said, he can... He, he wants to answer you much more than you can ask. <laughs> Praise God. So what's the major condition in effective prayers? When you, be, when you pray, believe that God has heard you and believe that it is done. So we're going to read three, script, three verses. In Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 24. And we're going to read it. Hebrews 11, 1 and verse 6. What is the idea here? Have faith in God. Trust him more than you trust or fear the challenge. Trust God more than you fear the challenge. Then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. The next verse. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. That's where we have problems. A lot of people finish praying and then they go and manifest doubt by what they think 
and what they say. He is saying here literally that if you speak to a mountain, figuratively this is speaking about your problems or your challenges. Everything that is against the will of God in your life that is not planted of God is a mountain. And he is saying that if you, not Jesus, he said, if you speak to the mountain, be removed and be thrown into the sea, he said, it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen because that's where it will happen. Many times, Jesus, looking at people that have received miracle from him, he said to them, your faith has made you whole. That means your belief has made you whole. He was called to go and heal a child that was sick by a centurion. And he was going to that place. And a woman who had no appointment with him, who had been disturbed, who had had this health issue for 12 years, said to herself, Jesus didn't speak to her. Jesus did not specifically say, come and touch the hem of my garment. There was no doctrine in all of Judaist scripture that if you touch the hem of a prophet, you will be made whole. The woman made up her mind. Said, if I touch the hem of the garment, this man is anointed. Even his clothes can heal me. I don't need to disturb him. Even to get an appointment with him is a problem. So she struggled through the press. That was faith walking. And it was in her heart. She didn't discuss with anybody. Imagine she has talked to her, with a, a friend of hers before then. They would have discouraged her. If she had spoken to a relative, they would have said, ah, don't you know that the, the, the rabbinical law says that if you are bleeding, you cannot go into the public and you cannot touch somebody. She ignored all of that, all of that um, uh, tradition and with faith, faith disobeys laws, disobeys tradition, disobeys protocols. And so she went and pressed through the people. There was a huge crowd. Jesus was on an appointment. He, he was not was not on schedule. The woman was not on Jesus' program that day. You might not be on God's program. But you can press in by your faith and take that which belongs to you. And so she pressed in and touched the hem of his garment. And the moment she touched it, was she the only one pressing Jesus? Everyone was pressing with physical, with their physical bodies. But this woman came with a faith that is spiritual. And faith is spiritual. She believed something will happen to her. And she went and touched. And that moment, healing took place. And the moment healing took place, Jesus said, who touched me? Favor Johnson sang a song about who touched me. And the, the people replied, which one be who touched me? Which one who not touch me? Can't you see that you are crowded around? And she said, I know power went out of me. You can draw power with your faith. If only you believe. You can cause a mountain to be moved into a sea. I don't know how many of you know Reverend and Mrs. Pocket. One elderly missionary and his wife. <laughs> they used to come around town. They are very old now. I've not been seeing them. So every year they make a round through Kano. They go to Niger, go to Mali, go to Ghana, and then come back again around after taking a break to their home country of America, they go around Africa again. So they were, it was even in this, uh, my former church that they went, that I met them, and they, they told this story, that they, they were in a church in Ghana, and they read this scripture, and there was an elderly woman sitting in the congregation. And this woman had a rock, big rock, upon a landed property that was bequeathed to her by her father. And the rock was preventing her from building on the land. Or even from making it possible for her to sell it. And so she came to the meeting and she heard the man of God read this scripture. 
And he said, if you shall say to this mountain, in her own case, she had a literal mountain. So she said, wow, if God said this, then let's walk it. So she went out in the morning, after the service, in the morning she woke up, stood in front of the landed property with that hill, rocky hill, and said, you rocky hill, mountain, I command you to move. And there was no sea around that area. Say, so I command you to move into the sea, according to what we read in the church yesterday. She went home. The next morning, the mountain was still there. She kept speaking to the mountain. She kept speaking to them, but she didn't give up. The first day she spoke, nothing happened. But did God hear her? Yes. So about, about two months later, there was a knock on her door. There were some contractors who needed to break that stone and make it like granite stone so that they can use it for a road construction around that area. And they were looking for who owns this fine rock that will be very useful for their road construction. And they said, we want to buy it. And the woman said, buy it. What do you want to do with it? Want to construct a road. Okay, so that means you people will break it and take it away. They said, ah, that's what it means now. She said, I'm not selling. They said, why are you not selling? I said, because I don't... I don't need money for it. My prayer has been answered. You are moving it, isn't it? Say yes. They say we are moving it and paying you for it. So, so one of our relatives came around and negotiated the amount to be paid. And they looked at the current value as at that time. This woman got more than one million Ghana cities for having her prayer answered. She sold the rock. The rock became money. And then her land was free for her to sell or use. Did the prayer work? God removed the literal mountain. And your problem is real. Your problem is physical. And so if you can speak to it, there is power in what you say. Why? Because you have been, you have been equipped by God. The next verse. I tell you, you can pray for anything and if you believe that you have received it, it, is, it will be yours. Now, when the Bible say anything, what does it actually mean? It means anything. Anything means anything. And there was a someone that will preach, I preached some months ago the fate of a child. And I need us to go back and listen to it again. Children believe anything. And I think that that's the kind of mind that God expects you to have. He says, uh, if you don't have a mind as simple as a, that of a child, you can't enter the kingdom of God. You tell a child that is four years old, I'm going to buy you a plane tomorrow. The child believes it. And begins to make preparations to receive the plane. This young lady is asked me to take them to the mall tomorrow. We were in the mall on Sunday. So I made a promise. Praise God. I made a promise. Who sent me? Since that day, I made a promise. Before I slept on the day, I made a promise. Uncle PG, did you say we are going to the mall on Thursday? This was Sunday. I said yes. So yesterday, we went out. I went to check something, and then I was coming back. We were together, and I bought them some things. So I thought that would cover for the Thursday. We got back home. Before we went to bed, I hope we are going to, <laughs> to the mall <laughs> on Thursday. So I said, but I thought the outing yesterday covered for it. No, it didn't cover. This evening, before we came to church, remember the mall? <laughs> How many of us are that persistent in asking God? 
Do you know why they kept reminding me? Because they believe I can take them to the mall. And if I try to dodge it, they have a way of cornering me to my promise. How many of you can corner God with his word to, a, to his promise? In this scripture, there are over 8,000 promises in the Bible. How many of you have you, how many of them have you accessed by talking God into doing it? He said, concerning my word, command ye me. So if you believe that you have received it, you will have. It will be yours. You can pray for anything. Do you have that much audacity to pray for anything? You must trust him more than you fear the challenge. You can pray for anything. If this has been established and you are bold enough, because what makes you bold is what God said. Did any of you here force God to make a promise in the scriptures? The scriptures were written when most of us were not even here. And the Apostle Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He said, this promise is for you who are hearing me today and for those who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will do what? Will call. Has he called you? So that promise is for you. How come I, you are not taking advantage of it? Let's go get into the nitty gritty of praying effective prayers. This is a wrap up. I'm trusting God that we should do that in the next 10 minutes. Effective prayers are prayers that you pray in the spirit. Praise God. You cannot pray in the spirit effectively except you have a walk in the spirit. You do not have a spirit walk, but you want to take advantage of praying in the spirit. And what does praying in the spirit mean? We had a teaching about that some time ago. This praying in the spirit is all encompassing. It means that you are intense, you are intentional, it is from your heart, it is fervent. It also includes praying in tongues. When, when you mention praying in the spirit, some people just attach it to praying in tongues. No. Are you now saying if you don't pray in tongues, then you are praying in the flesh? There is nothing like praying in the flesh. But people do pray in the flesh. <clears throat> Any prayer that is not based on the word of God is praying in the flesh. Any prayer that is full of doubts is praying in the flesh. Sometimes God just decides to have mercy on us and answer us. Because in the day of ignorance, God just allows it. But when he expects you to grow and have knowledge and you don't have it, he will expect that until you get it, you remain in one place. Now, there was an incident in Acts of the Apostles. The Apostle Peter was locked up to be killed by Herod. And the church decided to gather in one house and decided to pray. They were praying all night. And that night, their prayers reached out to heaven. Even dead, they were praying. They didn't even believe in their own prayers. So the angel of God was sent from heaven. He broke the prison gates, removed the chains from the legs of Peter, and caused the gate of the prison to open on his own accord as Peter approached it. And as soon as Peter crossed the gate, the angel disappeared. Especially as he walked him towards the city. He turned around and he didn't see the angel again. So he knew he had had a divine visitation. So he went straight to where he knew these brethren would be gathered. And they were still praying. Mato Shakalabaya. Father, release Peter. Release Peter. We believe, release. We believe your word. He knocked. And one of his servants, what's her name? Rhoda, came to the, the gate or the door and opened it. And out of excitement, locked it back and went to announce to them 
The prayer has been answered. What did I tell the girl? You are mad. Who told you? Peter that is in prison. Okay, then why were you praying? Why were you praying? The prayer is answered. You should shut down the prayer and go and welcome the man. You didn't even believe that he could be released that night. See, when you pray and you attach belief to it, God literally says the condition is fulfilled. Your belief may look illogical. Especially when you sit down in one place and say, Lord, and, yeah, and the year is, we are in April, and since January till now, you have not seen 100,000 gathered together in one place. Then you sit down and say, Lord, tomorrow, I have this challenge, and I need 2 million naira. And there's somebody who knows you, overheard the prayer, and he knows that you have been struggling to gather 100,000. I see my start laughing. Hmm. Don't shut up. Sorry. Please carry him. Carry him. Sit down with him. No, don't allow him to sit down anymore. Praise God. He's really asleep. Amen. So, you now pray that you need a million, two million naira. If you, that's why sometimes when you are believing God for some things, keep your mouth shut. Because if you talk to people who are not in the same wavelength with you, they will talk you out of it. I tell you that, use your head. In this economy, I don't operate by Nigerian economy. I operate by heaven's economy. I spend from God's pocket. Do you know how deep God's pocket is? But if your mentality is governed by Nigerian economy, the Naira is approaching 500 to 1 dollar. The pounds is heading towards 1,000. Your head will knock. So, don't operate with that mentality. The Bible says that my, you should not lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on Nigerian understanding. Don't lean on the Buhari economy. Don't lean on, on physical economy. When you pray and ask for something, believe that you have received it. It is not based. He didn't say when you pray in an economy that is working well, then believe that you will receive it because the Naira is exchanging in a good place with the dollar. Then whatever you ask during a good economy will be given. Is that what he says? He says if you ask and for something, believe that it is yours. So, and you have to ask in the spirit. And what is asking in the spirit? Ask in faith. So always pray in faith. That is the meaning of praying in the spirit. That's the overarching concept of praying in the spirit. Let it be that you are praying from the word of God. That is not governed by earthly circumstances or economic indices. So effective prayers in the spirit comes about when you do away with hindrances. Anything not in the will of God, avoid it. Then you can have a free passage with God. Praise God. A man who lives in sin deliberately cannot have effective prayer life. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Let's look at what it says. Do away with hindrances. Do away with hindrances. Hebrews 12 verse 1. Hebrews 12 1. For as for us, 
we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. So then, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and of a sin which holds us to who which holds on to us so tightly and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. So when you have sins, known sins that you don't repent of, I have said it several times, living in sin is that you consciously involve yourself in sin. Falling into sin means that you were standing. Can you fall when, if you are not standing? Uh, so we fall into sin, but when you fall, you get up. But living in it means you just arrange yourself inside. It's a major hindrance. All right? To avoid it. Anything that is not the will of God, avoid it. Then, number two, so in the spirit or so to the spirit. Galatians chapter 6 verse 8. So to the spirit. Galatians 6 verse 8. We are wrapping this up. So in the spirit or so to the spirit. He says, for that, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. So if you live a life that you constantly sow into the spirit, how do you sow into the spirit? Take in the word of God constantly so that your mind is filled with the concept and the mind of God. Whatever your mind is full of is what you do. When you sow in the spirit, you will reap abundantly in the physical. The mind of God, the work of God. Feed your spirit through fellowship. Like we have come here together now. Except the spirit of God is not dispensing the word tonight. Then you can tell me that I didn't gain anything. I just came to waste my time. How many of you believe you came to waste your time this evening? So you have sown into the spirit. You have allowed the word of God to feed you. You have allowed the word of God in a corporate worship environment to feed you. Number three, present your body as a living sacrifice. You find that in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. So it means that you give up activities, you give up habits, or you give up friends that are not in sync with the word of God. Praise God. And you obey righteousness. Do that which is right. And you make a daily commitment to put on the spirit of God. That's how you get to pray in the spirit. When you have all of this going on in your life, then you pray in the spirit daily. So we're going to read some scriptures about praying in the spirit and then we shut down. Romans 8.26. What are we discussing? Effective prayers. Romans 8.26. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. Do you know there are some things that you don't even know how to start praying about it? When you are walking in the Spirit... And you go to the place of prayers. Sometimes you just be groaning. Other times, as you are full of the Holy Ghost, you burst out in tongues. The Spirit helps us to pray with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. It is not the clarity of your English diction that makes God hear your prayers. If you listen to some people's prayer, it's like a speech, an eloquent speech in an MBA graduation convocation ceremony. Heavenly Father, as we gather in this magnificent auditorium, we give you praise beyond understanding. And then you hear all of that. You do all of that and it's not in the spirit. You have just impressed people. Have you not seen where somebody finished praying, people start clapping? Eh? 
Why are you clapping? Did he pray to you? It means the person prayed to you. Because nobody was moved in the spirit. That guy prayed. Did you hear his English? Everything was landing dim. But he's that's not what God answers. Sometimes what God answers, you can't even say it. It's only the spirit of God that overshadows your spirit that knows what to say to God on your behalf. Praying in the spirit. Jude verse 20. That one is, is very clear. Jude verse 20. Jude has only one chapter and it's verse 20. Let's look at that. Let's look at what he says. I thank God I'm not speaking from my head. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of what? The Holy, holy Spirit. Look at King James, what he says. But ye beloved, building yourself up, building up yourself on your most holy faith. Praying how? In the Holy Ghost. Now, what does praying in the Holy Ghost mean? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4 and 14. Let's quickly look at that. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm trying to convince you with the word of God. And it's only the Holy Spirit that can convict you to understand this. I am doing my job to teach. I have no power to convict anyone. Because a man convinced against himself is of the same opinion still. So, 1 Corinthians 14. Can we look at that quickly? For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit does what? But my understanding is what? Can you see where we have problems? What is that man saying? I'm not hearing him. See, there is praying, there is a prayer language in tongues. And there is the gift of tongues. Those are not the things we are discussing today. We are talking about the prayer language. We are not talking about the gift of tongues. Even though sometimes they walk hand in hand. I heard this story about a, a brother in Yola. He was in his official quarters. He came back from work and he was praying. And he was in his room. He was praying. And he was praying in tongues. And there was an Indian living next to him who decided to come to his window, the guy's window, the guy who was praying, came to his window and tried to be smoking. And all of a sudden he heard the guy praying in Nigerian. The guy was praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. You know what he heard? He heard the man speaking in Chinese. I was a Chinese man. And what was the guy saying in Chinese? This smoking you are smoking will kill you one day. You better stop smoking. I have warned you several times. And people have been used to warn you. Quit smoking. Your lungs are going bad. The guy was frightened. He went, turned around, knocked on his neighbor's door. He persisted in knocking. And the guy came and said, Please, I want to see the Chinese that is inside your room. Said, no, I don't have a Chinese here. You know I live alone. No, but there's a Chinese brother who knows me. He is inside. Said, there's nobody. Okay, come inside. The guys took him around the whole house. He didn't see anybody. He said, but I heard somebody speaking Chinese very clearly to me. Said, no, there's no Chinese here. The guy went, went back to the window again. And the brother continued praying. You know what the next thing he heard? You think there's a Chinese here. There is no Chinese. This, this, this your smoking will kill you. He dropped the cigarette, turned around, entered the house, and knelt down. That's how he gave his life to Christ. He said, so you were the one speaking Chinese. He said, no, I was praying. So God used his prayers to minister to that guy in an unknown tongue to the person who was praying. How did the people who gather in, on the day of Pentecost hear the apostles as they were praying 
in other tongues as the spirit of God came on them. They said people came from Italy, people came from Syria, and they all had their own tongue as the disciples prayed, as they ministered. But here we are talking about the prayer language. Because for everyone full of the Holy Ghost, there is a prayer language giving. What does the Acts of the Apostles say? The Holy Ghost came upon them and they spoke in tongues as God, as the Spirit gave them what? Utterance. So, the Apostle Paul is saying, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayed. That means his own mental understanding is useless at that time. So if you are praying in tongues and you want to understand what you are praying about, you are wasting your time. You won't understand it. It is your spirit that is praying. And if your spirit is praying, it is praying the will of God because that is effective prayers. Allow yourself to flow in it. When you pray in the spirit, you pray longer. You pray more on target. The devil does not understand what you are saying. The next verse. Okay, I said verse 4. 14 verse 4. That's supposed to be the first verse. 14 verse 4. This is verse 15. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue does what? Edifieth himself. But he that prophesied edified the church. So Paul was trying to explain the power of speaking in an unknown tongue. In fact, in, I, I, I advise that you go and read the entire chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. At one point, he said to the Corinthians, he said, I pray in tongues more than ye all. So verse 14 was the capping of this verse. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will, I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. That's balance. Praise God. So, when you pray in the spirit daily, what happens? It charges and strengthens your spirit. And once your spirit can be charged and strengthened, you overcome challenges. It enables you to overcome the weakness of the flesh. It makes it easier to receive from God and keep what you receive. It strengthens your ability to resist the devil. It causes your inner man to rise up in adversity. It reveals your spirit things. It reveals to your spirit things that you could never know by your own ability. And I've been blessed by the power that is available in praying in the spirit. I enjoy it most when I travel and I'm not driving. I just put on an earpiece and play some hymns. I play hymns from the internet. Either I download them, they're just playing chord on the keyboard. And I'm play, praying in the spirit. Sometimes you even see my mouth move. During that time, I'm holding a paper and a biro and I receive all kinds of revelations of things that will happen two years, three years coming. Praise God. There are some, some of the things I've received while praying in the spirit. I don't even have boldness to speak about it before people yet. Because a lot of people will not capture it. They won't understand it. They will not resonate with it. They will despise it. And I don't want anybody to despise what God has given me. So I hold it and build it until there is a profile enough to release it. Praise God. Hallelujah. In conclusion, public prayers and corporate prayers are very powerful. In Matthew 18, verse 18 to 20, he says that if two of you shall agree concerning anything that you pray, 
what will happen? It shall be done. So when one person prays for one hour, it's one hour. When two persons pray for two hours, it's considered ten hours. Because one will chase a thousand, two will chase how many? Ten thousand. That's why corporate prayers, prayed in a church environment or you have a group of people who come to pray, is very powerful. And today with the internet, we can even pray on WhatsApp. We can pray on, live on Zoom. It's still the same. Space is not a barrier. So how do you pray? You pray by, you start by worship, by thanksgiving, by adoration. You don't just enter God's presence and say, give me. For what? Have you worshipped him? Have you given him thanks? There is a way. He said, I, 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 I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Now, you know, I will enter asking anything he has for me. No. The next thing you commit yourself to him and to his cause. See, God is interested in blessing those who are assets and they give value to his kingdom. Are you an asset to God? Or you are a liability who comes always to ask. All right? Offer yourself as a willing vessel to serve in his kingdom. All these ones is prayers. Then pray for the church, pray for your local assembly, and pray for your pastor. It's scriptural. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Then pray for others, pray for leaders, pray for your community, pray for your nation. All this one, you have not prayed for yourself. You are asking questions. Is it not me that needs it? Then finally present your matters before him petition and supplication. Effective prayers. By the time you finish praying for the nation, even your own issue will look very small. Praise God. Let us pray. Ask God to give you further understanding, fuller understanding, greater understanding of effective prayers. Effective prayers. Father, we thank you for granting us understanding. Grant us understanding. Let these words not fall on the wayside. Thank you for fertile hearts. Fertile hearts. Fertile hearts. That we will begin to lead a life that is full of your presence through effective prayers. That whatever we ask in your name, it will be done. In the name of of Jesus. Lord, give us the grace to live a lifestyle like Jesus led praying always. A great while before morning, he left the environment, went out of the, outside of a town and found a lonely place and prayed. We might not go out of town, we might not go out of our house, but we can find a lonely place. We can find a solitary place and confine ourselves with you and pray. We can have a prayer altar we can have a prayer altar all by ourselves. Everywhere, every time G God spoke to Abraham and, and, and went into a covenant with him, he built an altar unto God. Do you have a prayer altar? Do you have a prayer altar? Or is prayer an emergency 911 call for you? Father, in the name of Jesus, help me to build an effective prayer mountain. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. One more prayer time. Do you have a need? And he has promised that if you ask him anything and you don't doubt, you will have it. So what is that thing that you're counting on God to do for you? Go ahead and pray. In the next two minutes, be specific. Look for a scripture. You can, you can use this one free of charge. John 14, 14. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That's God's word. Tell him, this is your word. And you cannot fail your word. And so, rather than the word of God fail, heaven and earth will have to pass away. Even if that happens, God's word will not fail. As sure as the sun rises up in the morning and sets in the evening, that's how sure God's word is. 
For over 6,000 years, the sun has not failed to rise in the morning and set in the evening. Father, thank you for every need of your children that they present to you tonight. Lord, meet those needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. There is nothing you cannot do. There is nothing impossible with you. Your word says without faith we cannot please you. But we have faith right now. Your word says if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, it will ask for anything. You can even command the mountain to move and to cast into the sea and it will obey us. Even a mustard seed faith can accomplish that. Thank you because the faith that we have tonight based on the word that we have received is bigger than the mustard seed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Grow our faith, O oh Lord. Every day by the word, grow our faith. By our habits of communion with you, grow our faith. We believe you have been richly blessed by that message. Should you require further counseling, we are reachable via our social media platforms. On Facebook, we can be found at Living Hope International Christian Center. On Instagram, we are at Living Hope Kano. Our WhatsApp number is 080-9455-7000. And you can call us on 081-564-87696. If you are in Kano or visiting, you can worship with us at Hall 3, the Researchers Nursery and Primary School, 122-128 Egbe Road, Kano, Nigeria. Our Sunday worship is 9 a.m. while our worship on Wednesday holds at 6 p.m. Remember, you are too blessed to be stagnant.